Hi everyone, my name is Yasmin and I am a Curriculum Ambassador for Psychology at the University of East London and today I'm going to give you just a little bit of a taste of what psychology can be like in university. So just before we get into the aims and objectives, let me just tell you how I got into psychology. So when I was probably about like 14 or 15 maybe, I was really fascinated by the works of Darren Brown. And for those of you who don't know, Darren Brown is like an illusionist or a magician sort of thing. And he uses psychology and misdirection to trick his audience and things like that. So when I really got interested by his TV shows and things like that, uh, um, I purchased his book, which is the one that you see on your screen called Tricks of the Mind. And this really taught me about the science behind certain things and especially about psychology. That's the first time I ever heard of psychology um, from Darren Brown. And when I researched psychology, I realized what it's mainly about. And it's mostly about just making sure people are healthy um, in all settings and making sure they're okay and best ways to make them healthy and what makes them unhealthy and what makes them think or behave in certain ways. And I just really, really found that really cool because I was always interested in how things worked. I was, all, I was always interested in mysteries, you know, kind of like, um, you know, when you see like a magic card trick, maybe on, I don't know, Britain's Got Talent or something. And they make a trick and you're just sitting there thinking how on earth did that happen like how did they do that and that is really the feeling i get with psychology because there are so many strange stories that you hear and you're always just kind of trying to think oh how did that happen but the best part is that you actually like try and find out how it happened you know whether it's through experiments or research and so that's why i love psychology now, this is what we're going to get up to today. So we're going to look at the different types of psychology and this actually includes new types as well. So you may come across types that you've never heard of before. We're also going to look at the best and worst things about being a psychology student, at least for me. We're going to take a look at careers in psychology and of course salaries, which I'm sure you guys want to know about. And we're also going to take a look at entry routes into psychology. So that is if you're maybe interested in taking it up as a degree, I will talk to you about how to actually get into that, into the university. Now, first off, where is this guy looking? Is he looking at you? Is he looking to the side maybe? Let's see what happens when we look into the middle of his eye. He's looking ahead, right? Now, what happens when we look at the tip of his nose? Suddenly, he's looking to the side. It's a really, really strange illusion. I know, I know. I'm sorry, but let me explain. So, there are lots and lots of pieces missing. Now, this isn't an exact half of a face, is it? It's not. There is the, um, the bridge of the nose that's missing, or the middle of the forehead, or the middle of the chin, the cupid's bow, lots and lots of things are missing. But your brain really wants to make sense of things for you, wants to make things very easy for you. So it takes as much information as it can and builds a picture for you. And that's why it kind of flits between one picture and another, because it's getting a little bit confused. Now, I'm just going to give you about 20 seconds just to read this. Ready? Go. Okay, how was that? Pretty easy, right? Now, the way you were able to read that, as you just read, is because your brain reads words holistically. That means as a whole. Now, imagine if your brain read the letters or the sentences letter by letter by letter. Oh my goodness, we'd be there all year. It would take way too long. So under the text box, there's actually something called like Cambridge. Can you see the word Cambridge? And then there's a jumbled up version of Cambridge. And the right hand side of it, there's kind of like building blocks in a way. Now these building blocks are actually the shape of the word. And it looks very, very similar to the jumbled up version of Cambridge as well. So the reason why I put that in there is to show you that reading is actually 
quite complicated a lot goes on so not only does your brain look at the letters but it even looks at the shape of the word all of this just to get you an accurate description of what you're looking at and so again so much goes on but your brain works so fast and tries to give information to you quickly and convert it into something that you understand that you don't even realize it's happening now that was the warm-up now we're going to move on to mental control and multitasking and we're going to see how in control you are so you guys know what multitasking is of course right so trying to juggle two things at once i'm not so good at that i'm going to be honest with you um but i'm sure you guys are much better let's so let's test it out now if you can i'd like you to please stick out your left foot and to twist it clockwise so just turn it around and around clockwise in the in the way of the clock and whilst you're doing that, I want you to raise your right hand and go anti-clockwise. Draw the number six. Okay, now how are you guys finding that? It shouldn't be too bad, shouldn't be too bad. It might be a bit tricky at first, but it should be relatively okay. Now let me tell you what's going on. Now, quick fact, your brain is split into two halves called hemispheres, left hemisphere and right hemisphere. Something you guys might not know though, is that it actually works diagonally, okay? So your left hemisphere, the left side of the brain, is in charge of the right side of the body, which means the right hemisphere is in charge of the left side of the body. You got it. So even though you were doing two opposite motions at the same time, so anti-clockwise and clockwise, because you split it into two halves of the body, so the left side and the right side, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere got to work together and that's why it wasn't too difficult because you kind of had like two parts of the brain to do different parts of the job now what happens if you were to change it up a little bit this time i want you to stick out your right foot and turn that clockwise and whilst you're doing that raise your right hand and go anti-clockwise now what you should notice is that as you raise your right hand and it's going anti-clockwise or it's drawing the number six in the air your right foot automatically changes directions or maybe you're experiencing a bit of friction or maybe you're experiencing as if like your foot and your hand are fighting each other or something now this is because you're only using the right side of your body which means your left hemisphere has to do all the work but you're not doing the same motion are you we're going clockwise and we're going anti-clockwise right and so that's where the multitasking gets in your left hemisphere is trying to do two things at once on the same side of the body and that's where it gets a little bit confusing and so that's just another example of how a simple change like just a switch of foot or a switch of hand can really make so much difference it's kind of funny okay now moving on to the different types of psychology now psychology is very 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 broad there are lots of different types and it's really cool because it's kind of like there's something for everyone in a way so i'm just going to go over just a very small handful of types of psychology now animalistic psychology any guesses what that is before i reveal no it is not about animals it's actually about the psychology of belief okay so why do we believe in religion why do we believe that black cats might be bad luck or walking under a ladder is bad luck why do we believe in certain things like that or maybe conspiracy theories you know for example the moon landing was it fake was it real or the the bermuda triangle why is it that ships go missing and planes go missing are there aliens living there or maybe it's just a magnetic field right so we look at conspiracy theories and we break it down using evidence and we understand why do people believe in it in the first place and what groups of people are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories and not Mainly, we also look at the truth behind the paranormal. So, for example, um, like ghosts or just things that we can't explain. You know, we really try and figure out what the truth is behind that. So, I actually took this as a subject. Um, I believe it was in my last year, my final year. And it was very, very interesting. And you really learn how to research as well. So, it's really cool. 
educational psychology now this is about the way we learn not just in school but our behaviors like how do we pick up on things and how do we make friends how do we talk to people how do we work in groups things like that so we talk about that also how do we remember things so for example you know on the left hand side um you can see like there's like a little gray looking brain thing and there is a little blue thing that little blue thing is called the hippocampus okay so that is a very key part in memory okay and so again we learn how do we remember things how why is it that we are able to remember the lyrics of a three minute song but we can't remember a shopping list comprising of just 10 items now we move, we also learn about negative versus positive reinforcement so for example something called token economy okay so let's see when i was in primary school and secondary school whenever i did really really good i would get things like um i think merits and postcards sent home if i was doing really well in maths or english i'd also get badges if i did really good or if i became a prefect and things like that i don't know what you guys have maybe you guys have similar but this is an example of positive reinforcement so this is your teacher's way of saying keep up the good work this behavior is really really good keep doing it okay now negative reinforcement so let's see if you do something really really bad and you might get minutes taken off your break or maybe you get detention or i don't know you know this is a way of teaching you that this is bad behavior and you can't be doing that right so that's negative reinforcement and that's also something that you learn in educational psychology and then we have forensic psychology, which is a combination of psychology and law. And there is actually something um, that I studied in forensic psychology called eyewitness testimony. And I found that I found it's really, really cool and very interesting. It changed the way I see things. So I thought I would share it with you guys. So eyewitness testimony, in case you guys don't know, it's the question of is seeing really believing so for example let's say you're walking on the pavement or something and a car accident happens right and you're a witness to that you saw exactly what happened and you saw that person a was going way too fast and person b wasn't doing anything bad right so now let's say they go to court because person a and person b are blaming each other and you also go to court as a witness saying well you know person a was going really really fast it wasn't person b's fault now you may think that this is enough evidence to suggest that person a is innocent or for i mean sorry that person a isn't innocent but actually your memories can change it can change over time there could be certain things that influence your memory and so now the jury or the judge whoever's listening to you in court they might not believe you 100 percent because of something called eyewitness testimony and there have actually been real life cases where you know people have gone down for crimes they didn't do because a witness got it wrong right so that's something that i found really cool um, to learn about so i thought i'd share it with you <clears throat> you also get a chance of providing a psychological perspective to criminal cases so perhaps somebody who did something really really bad they could actually have had maybe i don't know maybe they watched loads of tv shows where they showed you know like stealing and things like that and maybe that explains why they're like that you know you look at the psychological perspective like why is this person like this you know what predictions can i make to see how what what the criminal's next move is you know you really learn about things like that it's really really cool now we're going to neuropsychology now this is my favorite type of psychology i love this type of psychology it is the relationship between the nervous system and behavior so what is it about our nervous system that affects behavior and vice versa so for example let's just say um I don't know maybe you injure your brain a little bit in some way and you go to sleep for a long time and then you wake up and suddenly you just you can't remember who your friends are you know you can't really remember the color of your house or where you live and things like that now your neurologist now may decide ah this must be because the part of this person's brain injured is responsible for memory because why would suddenly this person be affected by it 
you know so that is something we learn about so how brain injuries causes people to act differently and what brain injuries can teach us of our brain functions so now we have sports psychology now sports psychology is about how our mind can affect athletic performance or how athletic performance can affect our mind and our psychological well-being we'll also learn about helping people or helping athletes with anxiety we talk about rehabilitation so for example perhaps a sports um a sportsman or a sports lady they lose i don't know maybe their arm or they break their leg or something they may need help to get back on track and how to get back into the sports field you know so that's something that you also learn about in sports psychology now this is occupational psychology and this is actually what i specialize in i'm doing a master's in occupational organizational psychology so it's definitely something i'm interested in and it's about how work can affect human behavior and how human behavior can affect work so specifically we look at how to make life more enjoyable at work for employees because we know that if employees enjoy themselves and that means they actually do better at their work and if they do better at their work then that means organizations become more successful right so it's about making working life easier and happier for others and making sure that everyone is healthy and their well-being and their work performance is at a very good and stable level so that is occupational psychology slash business psychology now this is something called modules okay i want to tell you a little bit about modules and if you don't know about it don't worry okay so modules are kind of like mini classes that your course is breaking broken down into right so you know for gcc some options you have to take like maths and english and some options you can choose like maybe um, design and technology or extra science okay so every university offers different modules per course and like i said before it is a mix of compulsory and optional options and this actually allows you to learn what you want to learn so on the left can you see those little blue boxes these are the options that i picked for my final year of psychology so i picked occupational psychology which we spoke about and i picked psychology of belief which we also spoke about animalistic psychology and i also picked cyber psychology and that is about how technology is changing around us and how we are changing technology so and i thought it would be really really useful so again just because i picked psychology at university doesn't mean i'm just gonna learn psychology full stop you can actually break it down into smaller smaller components and so you can kind of customize it to learn what you want to learn and maybe learn about the things that you can see yourself in the future so moving on to the best and worst things about being a psychology that sorry being a psychology student for me was okay so for example there was something called lab reports that i had never come across before and they're kind of like recipes but for experiments and for researches and because i was just used to essays and things like that i was really overwhelmed by it i was kind of stressed by it thinking oh i'm never going to be able to pass it i'm never going to be able to know how to do it and it was just too complicated for me i it was completely unfamiliar and i'm sure maybe you guys can relate maybe you've come across a piece of work that just overwhelmed you because you felt like you can't do it but i had to i didn't have a choice i had to try and thank goodness thank goodness i didn't give up and i did keep trying because i actually got used to it fairly quickly a lot quicker than i thought i would and now i know how to document and record experiments i know how to turn numbers into meaningful sentences and because of that that actually makes me look better when i apply for a job in psychology and that's because i didn't give up now i also struggle with group work maybe some of you can relate to that um we've all pretty much been in group works or we've been put with groups that we kind of struggle with sometimes and i used to really struggle with that. i was always used to working by myself i wasn't used to working in groups but then again i knew i had to learn this skill because when i go into the big world of work i'm gonna have to be working with people that i don't know you know so i had to learn and because i again i didn't give up now i work very well in teams in fact i love working in teams i think it's very very useful because everyone has something different to bring to the table they may have a skill that you don't have and you may have a skill that they don't have 
And so I learned that and I learned how to team build. I learned how to support my peers. I learned how to work with different types of people who work at different speeds or different skill sets. And again, that makes me look even better when I apply for a job. So when you do face challenges in university or wherever you want to go, just do not give up. Now, potential career routes. So we spoke about um, working in courts and things like that, like as a forensic psychologist. So that's one option. Also in hospitals. So for example, um, my auntie, she's a dietitian, which means she helps with people's like allergies and their nutrition and their food intake and things like that. But before she prescribes a certain diet, to one of her patients she has to go through it with a with a clinical psychologist to make sure that this diet won't affect her patient psychologically right and so that is one way you could work in a hospital because you can actually work alongside with other people which i think is really really cool and really fun and there's also rehabilitation you could work in rehabilitation units and you probably know what rehab is, right? So rehab isn't just for people with um, alcohol problems or drug problems or any other addiction problems. It's also for people who maybe have lost their limbs suddenly, like maybe they got into a skiing accident and they lost their arm or they lost their leg or something and they just don't know how to live a normal life without it. And so they go to a rehabilitation unit where people train them to get back on their feet again or you know be really really strong and just live a normal life there is also the option of working in university as a researcher or a lecturer like a teacher but in university you can also work in businesses and organizations like i said before just kind of partnering with them to help them do their best there's also coaching or like being a life coach maybe you want to help people do really really well or maybe there is a careers coach or a success coach where you want to share your experience and advise other people you know kind of like how i'm advising you guys because i've been through university and i've done psychology so i can give back and tell you guys things that i know now moving on to the interesting things so <laughs> the pay what is the pay like for psychology graduates well I'll give you one example for a clinical psychologist, okay? <clears throat> now, depending on their band, they will get paid differently. Now, by band, you can kind of see it as level, okay? So the higher the level you go, the higher the band number you go up. <clears throat> so when you are a trainee, you start off with band six and seven. So this is about 30 to 37,000 a year the more experienced you become so such as band 8 or band 8b you get maybe around 44 to 60k a year and then at consultant level which is band 8c and 8d you get 6 to 1 to 86k a year and then finally when you hit the managerial roles which is band 9 you can be getting 89,000 to over 103,000 pounds a year Okay, now this website here, savethestudent.org, that's a really good site if you want extra information. And over here, I want you guys to do this in your own free time. Now this is called the careers, um, the prospects career quiz. And you take the quiz, you answer a few questions about yourself, and they give you a list of really good suggestions of what jobs would be good for you, um, you know, what it entails, the salaries, how to get there. Um, you also look at like real life case studies. So maybe people who have gone in that direction and they can give you advice. So I would really recommend you guys do this. Now, entry requirements for psychology if you want to do it for at, at university now i won't go too much into this because you will learn about this um later on but just to let you know ucas is a system um through which you apply for university through ucas points okay and universities usually ask for specific a levels or equivalents so it's always best to check ahead so you know what path you're taking they always ask for five gccs minimum including maths and english always maths and english and just remember, it's never ever too early to plan ahead. You know, it's never too early to plan ahead. And you may change your mind in the future. You never know. But still, it's always good to plan ahead. 
So just a very quick recap. So we've had an insight into what our mind can do. And we've also seen just how complex we are, like even the way we read things. It's, it's you know, it's quite a complex thing, but we're doing it anyway. We're really amazing. So we've also explored the different types of psychology. Do you guys remember? Okay, so we have forensic psychology, remember? We also have educational psychology. We've also got sports psychology, neuropsychology and so forth. We've had a feel of what it's like to be a psychology student or you've, you guys get to feel what it is like in to be in my shoes. We've also taken a look at the different careers and jobs psychology can take you into. Do you guys remember what careers we spoke about? So we spoke about maybe being about a life coach or working as a forensic psychologist in court and so forth. We've also taken a look at graduate pay and salary. And finally, we've taken a look at how to get into psychology through UCAS and through university. Now, I really, really do hope you guys enjoyed this and you guys learned something new that maybe you haven't learned before so i'm really really grateful to be a part of this and i thank you so much for listening and i wish you guys a really great day